Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Double Line Strategic Commodity Fund webcast. Today's webcast is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Ron Riddell. Please go ahead. Well, thank you and good afternoon and welcome to the Double Line Fund's webcast with Sam Lau and Jeffrey Mayberry. The title of today's webcast is Driving Season. Today, Mr. Lau and Mr. Mayberry will be discussing our Double Line Strategic Commodity Fund. And here you can see the different expense ratios and tickers uh, for that fund. Just briefly on the standardized performance of the fund, you can see year to date, and this is through the first quarter, of 2022, the institutional share class is up 25.35% versus the uh, the benchmark, the Bloomberg Commodity Index, BCOM, up 25.55%. Uh, but the annualized return, we launched the fund 518 of 2015 through the first quarter of this year, an annualized return of 6.5% versus the benchmark of 3.38%. Would like to uh, make an announcement about our new ETF complex. It's now listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It was listed on April 5th. We launched with two uh, active ETFs. The first one is the Double Line Schiller Cape US Equities ETF. Ticker symbol on that is CAPE, C-A-P-E. It is a semi-transparent -trans active US large cap equity sector rotation strategy. And the second one uh, is the Double Line Opportunistic Bond ETF, ticker DBND and that is a multi-sector fixed income product. Uh, both of those are listed on uh, the New York Stock Exchange again. And uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us and uh, we can answer any further details. Uh, I wanna announce uh, some upcoming webcasts. Uh, we have two more in June. Uh, the first one, the total return webcast will be with uh, Jeffrey Gunlock and portfolio manager, Andrew Sue. And the second one will be with Ken Shinoda on the income fund on June 21st. If you wanna get a copy of today's slides, you just go to the, uh, the tab called Request Webcast Content and you can get the, the slides of today's presentation. We do have a new YouTube page uh, uh, on Double Line Funds. If you type that in, uh, you'll get content on Double Line Funds. Our Twitter handle is at DLine Funds and lastly, uh, we do have another YouTube channel for thought leadership. That's uh, Double Line, uh, Double Line Capital. There, you can see a geopolitical roundtable uh, hosted by Jeff Sherman, portfolio managers Bill Campbell and Valerie Ho, and then Ken Shinoda's Channel 11 also on the channel. We also have two uh, two podcasts. The first one, the Sherman Show podcast, the widely acclaimed Sherman Show podcast, and then Monday Morning Minutes with uh, Sam Lau and Jeff Mayberry. Those are available at DoubleLine.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. So without further delay, I'm gonna turn the webcast over to Sam Lau. Well, thanks, Ron, um, and hey, hey, and thanks everyone for tuning in with us today as uh, Jeff Mayberry and I talk about the Strategic Commodity Fund. And on the slide here, you'll see that uh, we've titled this this podcast, or sorry, not this podcast, this webcast, uh, Driving Season. And uh, I thought it was very appropriate given that uh, Driving Season is marked by the start of it, at least by the, the beginning of uh, Memorial Day weekend as the start of summer travel by planes, trains, and automobiles, and not uh, Steve Martin and John Candy here. But on the slide, we only have automobiles, uh, but planes and trains certainly also require fossil fuels for power in the form of unleaded gasoline, diesel, or even jet fuel. So on the top picture here, we have American Muscle, both in red and uh, the yellow variety here. And they look to be about circa 1970s. It, it kind of looks like a Starsky and Hus Hutch uh, car, for those of you who are old enough to remember, but uh, minus that cool white stripe. So uh, it, got, it got me a little bit curious based on these pictures. So I, I Googled the uh, the original Starsky and Hutch car and found that it was a 1975 Ford Grand Torino. And it had a, let's see here, a V8 engine, uh, a claimed horsepower of 150 ponies under the hood, you know, did zero to 60 in a purported 13 seconds. So a little bit slow by today's measures, but uh, more importantly, it had a claimed uh, miles per gallon uh, of 14 MPG there. So it sounds like a gas guzzler, but you know what? It actually, embarrassingly enough to say, it isn't that bad for an American muscle car manufactured back in the 70s because my 2019 car right now only gets 15 miles to the gallon. 
So those are the two cars on the top there and, and facing off with the Gran Torinos, potentially Gran Torinos there in the, in the lower pick is, uh, is new American production. I'm not gonna call it American muscle, but it does showcase American ingenuity. And I believe these are Tesla Model 3. So with that, in the similar vein, I Googled the te Tesla Model 3, and it looks like this electric vehicle does uh, zero to 60 in three seconds, uh, depending on how fast you're driving and which, which mode you have uh, based on a long range mode or a performance mode. And it has a claimed equivalent to you know, your old MPG, it's actually called MPGE, miles per gallon equivalent, based on uh, electricity of 113 miles. So definitely uh, more efficient from that standpoint. Um, but uh, it is faster, it doesn't require, and while it doesn't require direct fossil fuel input at this point, uh, likely in 2022, the electricity that you use to power a, a pure electric vehicle is probably has a good chance of still being generated by fossil fuels. So you're not getting away from it entirely if you're for those of you who think they're they're truly green energy focused right now. So uh, I guess the highlight of this and the theme of this this webcast, at least in the initial part where I'm gonna talk about the, some of the background fundamentals and what, I've, what we believe are longer term drivers of price support for commodities based on both the supply side as well as the demand side. Um, it's really the old facing off with new and that's what we're seeing today uh, going on, especially in the energy sector with what we've seen as a global transition, trying to take us away from old school fossil fuels and perhaps uh, industrial metals over to something like renewable green energy. And what I'll show in the upcoming slides is that this transition from dirty fuel to clean, clean fuel is going to require a significant supply of the old school commodities for the build out of that required green infrastructure. Uh, so with that, we do think that uh, commodities do have some price support from where we are. And moving on to the next slide here, you've seen that, and we all have kind of noticed it. I mean, despite the, the land of pains that you've seen in other traditional asset classes like stocks and, and bonds pretty much across the board, we've seen lands of gains in the commodities uh, thus far having a very strong run in 2022. Um, the Bloomberg Commodity Index here on the year-to-date basis is up 33% through today. The S&P 500 is the other way around, and it's down 17% uh, through today as well. And the egg, it's looking like it's going to be right around uh, a negative 9% on the print for, for the year to date as well. So while we take a look at the um, this longer run chart of the Bloomberg Commodity Index, um, it still looks like you know there, we're, we're a ways away from the highs that were reached back in 2008. And when we take a look at that peak that was reached in 2008, that was on the back of maybe a six-year run or maybe even a nine-year run if you bring it back to 1999 and uh, ignore that kind of that drawdown that we saw in 2001 and begin it at 2002. So based on that context, the, the current run that began in 2020 in, on the back of the pandemic looks like it could still have some legs left in it. Uh, there's still a little bit more gas in the tank, uh, we feel like from uh, the commodity standpoint based on this chart. Another thing to look at on this chart here is that, you know, that, that first super cycle, what people dubbed the super cycle of that strong commodity growth from late, or from early 2000, or I'm sorry, early 1999 through 2008, the primary driver of demand there in that early 2000s period was China, which had just entered the WTO, the, the World Trade Organization, and they were taking massive steps to modernize their economy. Uh, today, China is no longer the same driver of demand as it was uh, two decades ago, but you know, at least when we're taking a look at it on its own. But instead, for the 2020s, what, what we've seen, and also at, pretty much from 2015 on, I would say, um, we have had a consortium of over 190 countries that have signed and ratified this, this uh, agreement to, to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050 uh, under the Paris Climate Treaty. And that endeavor across these nearly 200 countries is going to be uh, commodity intensive and require uh, and post that underlying demand, we think, for commodities. Before we go into you know, some of the, the current drivers that we're, we're looking at in terms of the price support for commodities, it, it's always helpful to look back and think about what the more evergreen rationale could be for investing in commodities. And when you take a look at it from the old school approach, um, you know, Investment 101 tells you that you should look to 
to introduce uh, uncorrelated streams of return to your portfolio, thus having diversification benefits uh, to your traditional asset classes. In particular here, keep in mind, you know, for 2020, I think it's a great example with uh, uh, both stocks and bonds down so much, uh, whereas commodities are up. But overall, by introducing commodities into your, your overall portfolio, you have the potential uh, to, to gain a low to uncorrelated source of return to your traditional asset classes. Additionally, uh, commodities, and we're really experiencing now uh, on the back again of the, the post-pandemic stimulus aid field uh, inflation that we're seeing today, uh, both in prices as well as in wages, but commodities are uh, one of the better hedges to unexpected inflation. I think the reason behind that is somewhat intuitive, given that commodities are those physical assets, the raw resources that are that serve as the input into many of the consumer-based products that we buy. So in that vein, commodity prices tend to be the ones that lead uh, inflation higher. So definitely we've seen this, this hedge to inflation working out for, uh, through the commodity vehicles where it has impacted perhaps, or what has impacted negatively other traditional asset classes. And then of course you have the potential or incremental returns across each of the individual commodities market structure. We've seen that. Uh, uh, since 2020 as well. And then also commodity supply and demand is generally correlated to the cyclicality of the global economy. And I know there are fears out there that uh, perhaps we're moving into a, a period of weaker growth, but it is still poised to be um, above trend type of growth over the next uh, few quarters here. And then also given that underlying kind of structural uh, supply uh, undersupply is also this um, this kind of captured demand that comes from this clean energy revolution that we're talking about. We do think that that could provide some further tailwinds for commodity prices. And then here on this chart, we have a matrix of uh, commodities against uh, your your typical type of assets that, asset classes that you might see within uh, your your own portfolios here. Uh, and across the top, I should have drawn a, a nice little box across that that second row, the one that begins with commodities and goes across and shows you the correlation across U.S. large cap, small cap, uh, international equities, the various bond sectors, and then ending up with the dollar. But you can see there that commodities against each one of these individual asset classes here or sectors of asset classes does have a low to even times negative correlation to each one of these. But as a basket, when you take a look at it across all of these sectors, the average correlation of commodities to these other sectors here is uh, 0.16. And one thing I would like to point out here, just given it's it's a little bit of a unique situation that we've seen um, thus far since about 2021 or so. But if you take a look at the very far right there, on commodities versus the dollar index, you'll see that uh, commodities have a very large negative correlation to the U.S. dollar. As the dollar uh, uh, rises, then commodities tend to fall. When, com when the dollar falls, the commodities tends to commodity prices tend to rise. But that's not what we've seen in this go around, um, starting in in let's say around 2000, the late 2020 um, into early 2021. And what we have in this chart here is the relationship between a broad basket of commodities as represented by the Bloomberg Commodity Index, and that's shown in the black line there going back to 2009. And then the red line is the U.S. dollar index. I believe it's the DXY or the Dixie that we like to call it. And that's in red there. And you'll notice on the right-hand side, based on the, the axes there, that the, the dollar index is actually uh, inverted there. So to kind of better map out this relationship here. But as you see, with the red line in this case, then when it goes up, that means it's actually falling in value. And then when it drops, uh, because it is inverted, you're actually increasing in value. So you can see here that the relationship has held out fairly well between the black and the red line between 2009 to 2020, kind of wiggling and jiggling in, in similar um, veins there. But something happened in 2020, uh, late 2020, early into 2021, when you saw that the dollar gained in strength uh, and at the same time, rather than falling, as you would think, based on the direction of the dollar, you actually see that commodities continue to push ahead into the land of gains uh, continuing there. And I think a lot of that, again, comes from the supply demand imbalance that we'll be talking about throughout uh, this, this presentation here. So going back to the land of pain here, the this traditional 60-40 portfolio is represented by the S&P 500 and the Bloomberg uh, U.S. bond index, 
Uh, you can see we, we track these type of portfolio returns by year going back to 1988. And where we are today is at uh, the 2022, and this is updated through, I believe it's through yesterday, May 23rd is where the last print is, although I don't see it on the chart, but that's what my mem uh, that's what I recall it being. So uh, with that, you can see as right around the time of 100 trading days into the year, this is the worst start through that time horizon for your traditional 60 portfolio. And this, uh, again, kind of supports that thesis of, you know, perhaps uh, diversification and owning some commodities and getting a piece of that up 33% uh, through uh, May 24th would have helped improve your, your overall portfolio over this period of time. Uh, taking a look at it at a more granular level here on the top uh, section of the chart, we have the month-to-day performance uh, for various sectors of uh, various asset classes as well within there broken out by equities, fixed income, FX, and commodities. And then on the lower part of the chart, the second half there is the year-to-date returns. And you can see on a year-to-date basis on the bottom half again, uh, pretty much there's been nowhere to hide. I mean, everything is red absent the dollar in this view here, um, as well as the, the commodity uh, broad indices as represented by the Bloomberg Commodity Index and the GSCI uh, basket as well. But then everything except for copper there on a year-to-date basis of the commodity, individual commodities that we've listed here are also in the green, and many of them massively so. I mean, if you take a look at the energy components, uh, they're up uh, around 50%. Look at agriculture, it's up, uh, it's up uh, almost 30% there. And then uh, copper has seen some uh, weakness, and you can see the industrial metals complex to the right of copper there uh, up 8%. There's a little bit of a laggard there in this land of gains. Uh, that's been suffering a little bit, as you can see from the month to date above, where the the you see the red bars and the copper as well as industrial metals there. That's been an impact on the fear of the a slowdown in China around the, the zero COVID policy. Um, but now we're seeing Shanghai start to emerge from their cocoon here. Um, perhaps we'll see this uh, revert back. It does seem like in the, in the recent days, we've seen a little bit of a reversal there. But now I think I should be placed on another major city within China. Uh, the capital city of Beijing, which is now being uh, shuttered in, I guess you can say, into their, their apartments again. So we'll keep watching out for that. But thus far, the green that you see outside of the U.S. dollar on a year-to-date basis is in the commodity sectors, and the red is everything else. So let's move on to the, the current case that we have for commodities. I've already hinted at much of this, but we, our expectation is that we're entering into a somewhat prolonged period where supply of various key commodities are going to be uh, challenged and, and undersupplied there. And a lot of it comes back to the uh, investment, uh, the capital expenditures that have been placed within um, both the, the production of energy-based products as well as mining projects around industrial metals. And there's been an underinvestment in it over pretty much the last decade or so. And if you were to recall the, the chart that I showed at the outset, there was somewhat of a lost decade for commodity performance in between the time of the global financial crisis. Uh, let's call it around 2011 after the, the, the early rally off of the lows. But then from 2011 down to about 2020, there was kind of that lost decade in, in terms of commodities having uh, underperformance both on an absolute basis, but underperformance on a relative basis compared to equities and bond markets. So... With that, uh, we did see less emphasis placed on the future production of uh, both uh, energy through crude oil as well as industrial mining projects. And a large part of that is because of the shift in focus that shareholders of these publicly traded, oftentimes the biggest companies are the publicly traded ones. Uh, there is a shift in that focus from uh, by shareholders from focusing on future production because, again, that lost decade of returns, why would you want to uh, place your free cash flows to the expansion of more commodity supply in the backdrop of that declining price market. And instead, shareholders wanted to shift focus over to profitability for themselves. They wanted uh, these publicly traded companies to, to increase their dividends, um, perhaps uh, increase their, their shares of buyback. And that, that I guess that you know, would have served to work if there wasn't this need for, for demand that would be arising from this transition to clean energy. Um, as well as a few other things, but that in itself has served to, to kind of put us in the situation where we are in a period of being undersupplied on various key commodities just at a time when we probably need it most. 
On top of that uh, lack of investment or underinvestment, we've also seen, uh, in particular, the E component of ESG, which has been a very hot topic and something that has been discussed uh, across most boardrooms nowadays. But the E, as people know, probably know, stands for the environmental concern. And there's a certain amount of pressure on publicly listed companies uh, to reduce their footprint, uh, their carbon footprint, and also their destruction of strip mining, you know, destruction of the earth through strip mining via the E in the ESG. So that can also exacerbate this, this market tightness as the, the social sentiment has shifted towards um, leaving uh, the earth in a better place than what we found it kind of uh, mentality. So with that, uh, in terms of uh, the, the demand side, the carbon tr neutrality and this transformation and this transition to clean energy is going to, ironically enough, um, serve to increase the demand for a lot of these old world economies. If you think about the use of energy, again, the diesel, the, the gasoline, the, the jet fuel that's going to be required to not only transport, but also build the, the physical infrastructure that's needed to, to basically rejuvenate our, uh, our uh, infrastructure here around energy, not just in the U.S. When I say our, I mean globally. This has to happen across the world because, again, I think it's around 195 countries that have signed and ratified that Paris uh, uh, Climate Accord. So in addition to that fuel that, that's required, you're also going to need the building blocks, the building materials that uh, industrial metals bring. So we do see this as the underpinning for a kind of a consortium, again, of countries that are going to lead to this demand for commodities to replace that one China country uh, back in the early 2000s that prompted that first uh, super cycle in commodities. And then, of course, unfortunately, um, we do have geopolitical event risk that seems to live with us uh, daily here. Uh, and the unfortunate events, what we've seen uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine is it has severely exacerbated the supply chain for, for many uh, commodities, particularly energy uh, for European countries. But that has certainly has had knock-on effects across the commodity complex as well. Um, but getting into some of the, the details behind what I've been talking about, uh, kind of hand-waving about is the, the slowdown in capital expenditure in the production of energy. I'm going to focus on energy first and then moving to uh, industrial metals. But here on the chart, going back to 2000, you can see there's the ramp up in capital expenditures going beyond even the global financial crisis and beyond that peak in 2008. Um, but you saw that that um, the, uh, the expenditures and the investment in these areas kind of peaked out in 2000. Uh, tw uh, 2014 or so before dropping down uh, through 2020. And that in, in itself is going to, has uh, impacted supply of uh, uh, crude oil. And given the fact that it's not a Fed money printer, you can't just flip a switch and print out new um, commodities, new oil like you can uh, money nowadays uh, across, via, the, via the central banks. This is a very long cycle type of production right here. And when you're talking about going from you know, the decision to, to, you know, to, to produce oil to the exploration and sourcing of, of that oil to the actual mining, or not mining, but the drilling, especially on offshore rigs, some of the longer cycle uh, projects there, those can take uh, up to 10 years for, for you to, to really go from decision making to, to getting some oil out of the ground. It's not just like the Beverly Hillbillies where you take an errant shot and nothing. You know, oil comes uh, comes out of the ground there, so we are seeing this uh, this last ten years or last eight years or so of under or relatively lower investment in capex. And from what I understand, too, based on the research, a lot of this capex is actually just going into the maintenance of existing projects rather to rather than the exploration of new uh, new uh, wells. So on this chart here, I have the, the total U.S. crude oil inventory. It looks a little bit weird on this chart, but if you were to look at the gray shaded area that is range bound by the two uh, black lines there, that is the total crude oil inventory, including that of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve here that we have in the U.S. going back for the last 10 years. So from 2012 to 2021, and you can see along the horizontal axis on the bottom, you have the, the various uh, months for each one of those years. So effectively what this gives you is a seasonality type of chart. Uh, and then all of those years, the nine years between 2012 and 2021 are represented through that shaded portion with the dotted being the, the average uh, uh, for that nine year period. The 10th year is where we are indicated in the red 
that is 2022. And you can see, and I would point out two things here. One is that it started out fairly low at the low end of that nine, or let's just call it the 10-year range now that we're including it. Um, but beyond that, uh, we're significantly lower than the, the overall 10-year range, uh, especially at a point where if you take a look at the trend from, let's say, January out to the beginning of May into kind of June is when most of the time you see a build in inventory. And that's because, again, we're heading into driving season. We're heading into peak travel season when people like to get on the planes, trains, and automobiles, fire up their cars, fire up their uh, diesel fuel uh, trains and their jet or their yeah their uh, jet fuel uh, airplanes there and really get out on the road. Uh, for summer vacation. So during that period of time, there's usually a build in crude inventory in order to kind of meet that demand for the distillates uh, that are used to power those, those vehicles that we're talking about here. But right now we're in the other way around where that red line is actually trending down and it doesn't look like uh, it's, it's abated at all. So we'll continue to monitor to see this, but you can see we're at multi-year lows just at a period of time where for oil, um, we're probably going to be needing it uh, at a higher uh, amount given the, the driving season just around the corner. So with that, here's a nifty little ratio that uh, we, we take or people take a look at. And it's uh, basically the crude oil stocks to, to use ratio. And you can see that's at multi-year lows. Um, the, the ratio is calculated by just taking a look at how much inventory we have relative to the amount of demand. And we're just off of the lows here going back to 1998. Uh, the next view here is on the distillates I mentioned. It's a very similar looking chart to the crude oil. This is basically the, um, the products that come out of uh, uh, the foundation of crude oil here. So you can think about it as your diesel, your heating oil, gas oil, and gasoline. But again, we're at the lower end of the range, just at a point where we should be amping up the, the inventory build. We are on a continuous draw here. So it doesn't bode well right now. Uh, yesterday when I was driving up, uh, the local gas station was at 708 for a gallon of premium. Uh, that's the first time I've seen it over seven, and it's gone the other way around since when uh, Biden back in March 31st announced that he was going to release up to 180 million barrels of crude oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. And this is what I have on the chart right now. Um, if you take a look at it, uh, this goes back to, I want to say, okay, 1982. Uh, really, the, the SPR, as it's known by its acronym, was created in 1975, and the first shipment of oil touched the, the salt caverns back in 1977, but this, for some reason, is as far back as it goes. And you can see from 1982 out to maybe around 2009, 2010 or so, we're in a period of you know, build for the most part. I mean, there's periods where it just stayed stagnant, but during times when I suppose oil is cheaper, they look to build uh, uh, oil, or perhaps as well as uh, if the demand is, is increasing. They just want to have the buffer. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve was created to act as a buffer against future oil shock. And recall that I said it was uh, legislated back in 1975. That was on the back of the uh, OPEC oil embargo, which I believe was in 1973 or early, early part of the 70s. So it's designed to be a buffer against real oil shock. But you can see what we've been doing since Basically, 2015 is we've been on a draw, and usually these things are supposed to be here uh, to draw from if there's an oil shock, let's say, from a geopolitical event or from a, uh, a natural, perhaps, like weather event, like hurricanes taking off some offshore uh, pipelines there. So with that, we've been drawing down, but there hasn't been as many of these events that you would think of. Uh, based on those things I just described there. But really what's been happening is since 2015, uh, Congress legislated a law that we can actually sell forward from our strategic petroleum reserve to uh, right now it's largely Asian countries uh, to help fund the budget. So that's a little bit of uh, political insight there. So that's been on the decline. But what looks to be a capital I here on the right-hand side in black, that is uh, at the top part of the I where it cross and intersects the, the blue line is when uh, President Biden made the announcement that the release would come, you can see we're currently about 30 million barrels less than that. So it's about 17% of the way there if we were to actually go to 180 million barrels. But if we were to drop it down to 180 million barrels, uh, you would be down to somewhere around 380 million barrels in Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Um, just in time for us right on the back of driving season, we're about to enter into hurricane season. So if pipelines go off of the 
offline on that, uh, you know, the strategic petroleum reserves are on current draw right now at, at an accelerated pace. Hopefully we have enough buffer there to, to kind of defend against that in the future. Uh, other countries across the world are in a similar position. These are the OECD countries, of which there are 38 members, including the U.S., also in a very similar pred uh, predicament there. And then oftentimes people will ask, it's like, well, you know, can't OPEC fill the gap? In fact, I think the administration has asked OPEC to fill the gap, and the OPEC came back and said, no. You know, we're being cautious with the way we approach things because we don't want to oversupply the market when it's not, not necessary. But I think if you look under the hood on what they're saying, what we have here on the chart is the uh, is a piece from uh, Bank of America, uh, and it shows the the OPEC spare capacity estimates. And this is as of February 2022, so three months ago. Um, and you can see right now the spare capacity, uh, and spare capacity is how much the max capacity is relative to what they're currently producing. So the differential there is the spare capacity, how much they could potentially bring to market if they needed to go full capacity if they're even able to go full capacity based on maintenance. But you can see here that the spare capacity is highlighted by the kind of the bluish, like uh, what's it called, the fruit stripe type of gum um, that looks like the, the blue flavor and then the yellow flavor. Yellow flavor is the Iranian uh, spare capacity and the blue is the other remaining OPEC countries. Altogether on the right-hand side, uh, you can see that the summation of the spare capacity and Iranian spare capacity is just under four million barrels uh, a day that they can bring to market if they needed to. And since they've been increasing that since uh, February by a, uh, by a, uh, smaller increments, I think we are under, it's safe to say that we're lower in spare capacity than we were just uh, back in February. One of the, the keys for demand for oil has come in from driving. Uh, you can see it's not just a, a U.S. phenomenon or even a develop, developed market phenomenon, but across the world, we've been seeing a, a strong recovery in, in driving trends uh, to the point where now in 2022, we're, we're near the highs going back uh, to, to pre-pandemic uh, just through January 2020. So uh, now that we're entering driving season, we'll see where this goes, but we'll keep an eye on that. One area that hasn't recovered in terms of trains, uh, in terms of uh, transportation rather, is the uh, the planes section of uh, of travel. And you can see passenger air travel is yet to recover. Going back to December of 2019, we're still well below, uh, for the most part, across uh, all countries here. The, the big outlier here is the Asia Pacific. They do have much more onerous restrictions and quarantine measures in place that perhaps uh, cut some of the freedom of travel around there, amongst other things. Uh, but with that, you have uh, the other parts of the country that look like they have been on the road to recovery. I know for ourselves here, we've been doing a lot more business travel. People are getting out on the road, also for pleasure more. Um, so uh, I should say getting out there in the air more for pleasure now. So we'll see how this uh, continues to, if this continues to, to trend up. But my sneaking suspicion is that it will continue to go up. Um, I do see we're getting a little bit closer on time, and Maber is probably cursing me under on mute here. But uh, let me just go through these uh, industrial sections real quick, and I would focus your attention here to the dark blue bars here. And this is uh, the amount of capex that has been taking place uh, globally going back to 2000. Very similar type of trend that I showed you earlier with uh, oil production. You can see that it peaked around 2012. And it's been on a downtrend since then. Out post 2021, I want to say our estimates here, but the estimates, if they aren't updated, uh, do seem to be pointing lower as well. And this is a, a big issue because, as I mentioned, the renewable energy transformation, uh, we're going, that's highlighted in green across these various pie charts. On the top left, you have the 200, 2020 mix of energy production. You can see that the green section only represents 12%, but by 2030, uh, it, it's estimated to increase up to 42% and then 55% of total energy generation by 2035. And if you think about 2050, while it's not listed here, if we are trying to get to that net zero, uh, a la the Paris Climate Treaty by 2050, you would imagine the renewable section to be a large, much larger component of that overall pie. And why that's important is when we take a look at the demand for um, various industrial metals in order to create this infrastructure. We're focusing here on copper, but it is representative of the other areas like aluminum, nickel, and zinc, all of which are the building blocks, again, for uh, physical infrastructure, especially so for these clean energy source uh, type of uh, uh, vehicles here. So 
Looking across here, everything to the right of that vertical dotted line is an estimate and the projection of where we are going to have to go based on demand to meet this uh, kind of uh, this tra energy transition. And you can see the biggest part of driver of the growth is going to be from electric vehicle demand. So it's that white uh, card that I showed you in the beginning that did zero to 60 in three seconds and something like 150 miles per gallon equivalent of oil there. So that's going to drive a big part of the copper demand, but also wind and solar is going to be a big component of that as well. Um, here, really quickly, your conventional car. So my 2019 gas guzzler probably sits in the middle of the conventional cars. Let's just call it 35 uh, pounds of copper is required. But if you go into your Prius, that's around 85. If you go into your plug-in uh, hybrid electric vehicle, that takes 132 pounds. Your Model 3 takes somewhere around 183 pounds. And then if you're to go into a battery electric bus, which I think would be, you know, some of, some of those orders are already in across multiple cities and countries, that's a whopping 814 pounds per vehicle there. So uh, illustrating the fact that there is going to be a strong demand if we are all on board to get to carbon neutrality um, by 2050 um, as we build there. So with that, when we take a look at uh, the projected electric vehicle sales, those are projected to exceed the sales of new vehicles of your standard and internal combustion engine vehicles by somewhere in the mid to late 2030s. Now, if you can draw your lines here on the left-hand chart here, the dashed line is where we are globally. The red line you can see um, is China and the teal line is Europe there. You can see that they're on a faster pace. They've made a, a, a bigger initiative to, to get to kind of electric vehicles. And for China, it makes sense. They don't produce any real uh, crude oil there. So for them to, to move away from the U.S. and dependency on crude oil that might come from the Middle East is, is a big strategic move for them. So they've been early adopters of this. But you can see globally, it looks to be around 2035 is when the rest of the world on average catches up to 50-50 um, uh, sales between ICE, uh, ICE vehicles and uh, EVs. But that doesn't mean the death of fossil fuels that's going to be required for fueling up your, your internal car. But Inter internal combustion engine, uh, you can see on the chart on the right there, that it is still, while it's on the rise through 2035 and it does decline slightly from 2035 on, it's not going to disappear immediately. It's still going to have a big component of transportation that requires uh, fossil fuels. And right now, transportation is roughly, I want to say, if memory serves, around 70 to 75 percent of total uh, energy consumption uh, for fossil fuels right now. So Definitely a key component isn't going away anytime soon. It's going to diminish in size, but it will still uh, be uh, present in our garages, most likely past 135. And then finally, the last chart for me before I hand it off to, to Jeff Mayberry, uh, where he can talk about the, the structure of our fund and how we think it's a better way to, to approach the commodity market is this annual investment uh, that is projected to be required to get to net zero emissions. Uh, and you can see each year uh, with culminating with a peak in 2036 is anywhere between about a trillion, let's say, out to, to three, just under $3 trillion per year that's going to be required globally to get us to this net zero goal. And you can see the various um, tranches there of, of the requirements uh, where they're going to be drawing this industrial metal, in, or sorry, not industrial metal, but this investment from, which will require industrial metal, um, energy, and other natural resources to get that. But with that, I'm going to pass the mic, the camera, as well as the clicker over to my colleague, Jeff Mayberry. Jeff Mayberry, it's all yours. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I certainly was not uh, cursing you under my breath. I think that uh, looking at the fundamentals behind the commodity market today uh, is a very important uh, piece. And certainly uh, given the, the market run up uh, and showing uh, talking about the different fundamentals and, and why we think that the commodities are still a good investment uh, was definitely worth everyone's time. And if we go to the slide here, what you can see is the structure of the Double Line Strategic Commodity Fund. And uh, Sam, if you, uh, or, or, or listeners or viewers, if you watched earlier, you heard Sam uh, in the video talk about how the uh, Strategic Commodity Fund is a long biased fund. And what does that mean? That means that uh, we're, we're, we always are long. We're, ne we're never going to go long, short, no, no allocation. Or, or an equal allocation to long and short, but we're always long biased. So when we're when we're bullish 
on commodities will be 100% uh, commodities, uh, such as we are today. Uh, will be 100% commodities in our strategic allocation here on the left-hand side. You can see it says MSB FMCI. That's our, our commodity index that we uh, allocate to. And then when there are times, and it hasn't happened in a while now, uh, when we are not as bullish on the commodity uh, market overall, we will make a tactical allocation to the double-line commodity long-short strategy. And we'll get into that very quickly. Uh, but given the, the current market environment, we thought it was best to focus on the long-only side of things uh, today. So... If we take a step back and look at uh, just the the structure of the commodity of the commodity prices in the commodity market, uh, real quick, uh, you might have heard these terms before: contango and backwardation. Contango is when inventory levels are plentiful, demand is low. You roll down the price curve. So, you, if you think about something like gold today, gold has a, given uh, you have storage costs that uh, you have opportunity costs. You know, interest rates are actually above zero now, uh, so your your interest cost, your opportunity cost, is higher than it was. Uh, you're you, you're better off, um, but you, you have to pay more to buy gold in the future because of that opportunity cost and storage cost. So that's rolling down the price curve. Um, and this is a very extreme example uh, from one month, your price goes from 100 to 95. So all else being equal, you would lose 5% of your dollars uh, as that price went from uh, 100 to 95. Now, if you look on the opposite, you have backwardation. That's something uh, inventory levels are scarce, demand is high. Uh, something like gasoline today is a, is uh, is in very high demand and will be in high demand given it is uh, coming up on driving season. And so the price of gasoline, all else being equal, would go from 100 to 105. So you get that 105, or you get that 5% roll in this uh, in this hypothetical scenario um, in one month. And so what we like to do is we would like to invest in commodities that have that uh, exhibit more backwardation than contango because we like to roll up the price curve as opposed to rolling down the price curve. And so when we do look at, uh, at the commodity market uh, or our commodity strategy, this is the, this is the commodities uh, that we invest in in our index. And I know there was a question uh, we got talking about what do we actually invest in. Uh, this, this index this, uh, is made up of 11 commodities. I think Sam uh, mentioned it earlier that you have 11 commodities. So in metals, we have copper and nickel. Uh, in energy, we have Brent oil, crude oil, gasoline, uh, gas, gas oil, gasoline, and heating oil. And then you can see, uh, you know, soybeans, sugar, cotton, and live cattle in the agriculture and livestock. And what we do, we do is it's roughly equal across the three broad market sectors. So we're about a th so when we rebalance the index every January, we're about a one third in metals, so one third uh, combined in copper and nickel, one third in energy in those five energy commodities, and then one third in uh, the other um, five commodities. And so really, when we look at uh, the other four commodities, sorry, I knew that math didn't work out. Uh, and the other four commodities. So what we do is we still have that broad commodity exposure, but we are invested only in those commodities that over time historically have exhibited the highest degree of backwardation. Also, uh, given that, you know, we want to, this strategy isn't a mutual fund, we want it to be very uh, liquid. So we want to invest only in the commodities that are, that are the most liquid, because when you are investing in, in, in a fund, you're only as liquid as your least liquid uh, you lease liquid contract. So certainly we want to make sure that we are invested in the most liquid commodities. And similarly, uh, we choose, pick and choose the actual maturity or expiration dates for the commodity futures so that we can make sure that, to keep them uh, in a highly liquid environment. And so these are the 11 commodities we use. Uh, some of them Sam mentioned earlier in, in terms of his fundamental outlook, uh, nickel, copper, and the industrial metal categories, um, and certainly talked a lot about uh, crude oil and gasoline. Now, when we're not bullish on commodities, we will invest in the uh, double line commodity long short strategy. This is a we won't I will I will talk about this very quickly because we're not in it. We haven't been in it for a very long time. Uh, but really what it is, is we will go long some commodities. Uh, we'll go long commodities, short commodities we don't like and uh, do that in equal dollar amounts per commodity. So we're not taking on a, a short bias or a long bias. Uh, it's just a matter of trying to gain some additional alpha to, to um while we're not wanting to be 100% um, 100 invested in the in the long only index, uh, really what it is is diversified. It'll be in across the uh, across the different uh, sectors of commodities: agriculture's energies, industrial metals, and precious metals. And we've been doing this since uh, 2012 here at Double Line. And so, how do we make that decision uh, between the long only index and the long short index? And we use momentum. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have this timing uh, signal that we developed, and it's a rule-based timing signal, so it's very systematic. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that we do we run every month, 
calculate the, uh, cal you know, run the rules, calculate the relative attractiveness of commodities. And if it's attractive, if it's, if, if it's, we're bullish, if it's a, as, as bullish as it can get, we will go 100% into the MSBF MCI index. And if we're, if we're not as bullish, maybe we will roll a little bit into some of the long short index and together we'll always make up 100. So if we're not that bullish, we're 75% long, we're only 25% long short. So you're not getting uh, above and beyond allocations. You're at the most invested 100% in the commodity market, but you're always invested 100% in the commodity market. The reason why we have this timing mechanism is that uh, we, we wanted the incremental returns from, or potential returns from the uh, long short strategy, but also commodities can be volatile. Uh, I think everyone can see that. Everyone knows that when they're volatile, there are times when maybe you don't want to be uh, fully invested in commodities. So we will do that. We will do that and dial back the risk exposure, dial back your overall exposure from commodities when the momentum is, really isn't working out uh, as we like. And you know, we, it's, it's something that we run systematic, but we, we, uh, we re retain that ultimate discretion to adjust the strategy. We don't ignore the signals, but sometimes we uh, will tweak around the edges given uh, cash flows and uh, in, in, in minimum investable sizes. And here on this chart, we can see over time. So this is the life of the double line strategic commodity fund. Uh, we did launch, we just passed our seven year anniversary here last week. Uh, and you can see that we started off in a point where the quantity market, you can see that black line is the uh, BFMCI index. You can see started off and the commodity market, commodity market uh, dropped. And you can see that we started off at a 60% allocation, went up to you know almost 80% and then back down to 50. So right out of the gate, we tested this commodity timing signal in terms of not allocating 100% to the long only index and allocating some to the long short. And then as the commodity market was uh, kind of running up there in the bottom, in the kind of early 2016, went back to 100. And you can see it moves around. We will be 100, we'll be at 50. Um, it's a pretty dynamic process, even though it only happens once a month. Then, but you can see, look on the far right-hand side, uh, since, you know, call it October 20, 2020, we've been dark blue the entire time. So we've been 100% MSBFMCI index, uh, since that time, and that's as long as we get, that's as bullish as we get, 100% in the index. But we will move it around, around at a time. You know, we did see the BFMCI kind of peak over here. We're still 100% bullish, uh, but maybe we're not a, not a little bit as close to uh, being invested 100% of the time, or 100% in the index 100% of the time. And you know, when we do look at that, we can look at the uh, calendar year performance, and you can see in 2015, uh, we did have a, a less of a drawdown than the Bloomberg Commodity Index, given that volatility dampener, given the uh, less of an allocation, less than 100% allocation to the BFMCI index. So that performed as well. We did get the rebound back in 2016, 2017, 2018, uh, similar to 2015, just not as, a, as deep of a drawdown. And then 2019 and 2020 were very interesting times of the market where you had a lot of volatility, you know, even for commodities, you had a lot of volatility. Uh, so, you know, we got, did get a little bit off sides there in, in both of those years, uh, but really made it, made it back in 2021. And then 2022, it's pretty much neck and neck uh, with the Bloomberg Commodity Index uh, for, for, for that time. Now, there, there was a question in here that was kind of asking, like, how come you've underperformed a little bit so far this year? And really, remember, we're invested in the 11 commodities uh, that, that, I, that I listed earlier. We're not invested in something that has been up a lot, that has been in the news a lot, and that's natural gas. And so there are times uh, when our, our commodity exposure is going to um, – is going to to be a detractor from return or relative returns uh, because we're not in the one hot commodity that's been up a lot. Uh, we're also not in gold, even though that's been a kind of a that's probably been a, a bonus. Uh, but there are times when we're going to we're going to miss some of these commodities because we're only in the 11 commodities. But we think over the long term, which is how we like to invest, we're not investing for the trade over the next month or the next two months. We're investing over the long term. We think that investing in the commodities that have more backwardation that are rolling up the price curve as opposed to rolling down the price curve um, are, is really the place to be. We can add that incremental returns. Um, and then you can see that overall, this is so, uh, if you look at the uh, the dark blue line is the uh, double line strategic commodity fund. Look at it, you can see that the performance, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the performance uh, for the seven years that the fund has been around without performing the Bloomberg Commodity Index by 230 basis points with a very similar volatility profile versus the BFMCI, uh, which has a lower, uh, has a higher return, but also higher volatility. So that that uh, timing signal is working to reduce the volatility of of the fund, while still adding adding an outperformance to the Bloomberg Commodity Index. 
And that's our goal. And you can see, you can really see that run up here in uh, 2020 um, that, w that we've had versus, uh, you know, it, when, when Sam was showing the Bloomberg commodity charts, um, much more longer term, it does feel like the, uh, there's been a big run up in commodities. But as Sam mentioned earlier, that longer term chart shows there's still a long way to go until we get to, uh, to kind of the prior peak in terms of the commodity market. So we think that um, being long only is a good thing to be right now. We think that it makes sense to be long only, to invest in these commodities that are more backward dated and that this is the place to be and the, and the way to invest in the, uh, in the commodity market overall. So be diversified, uh, but take, take advantage of kind of the uh, structure of the commodity market and really be in a place where you can take advantage of the backwardation um, and be invested in the broad commodity mix. And so with that, that's the last chart here. Um, I'll leave it up and we can go through the disclaimers and whatnot. Uh, but we'll go through the um, we we'll go through the strategic commodity or I'll go through some questions here that we had. Uh, someone asked, how or why am I unable to access the Bloomberg Commodity Index uh, on, on other on sites? And I saw this question while Sam was talking. I pulled it up. I agree. I was an, unable to find it. But what, one thing I did do is I went in and I searched for DBCMX and it will pull up our, our benchmark, which is the Bloomberg Commodity Index. So that's one way to find it. It shows the comparison. Uh, to from our fund to the uh, to the commodity index, and so uh, that's kind of uh, it's kind of a workaround. It's a, it was I, I, I similarly I got frustrated with uh, being able to figure it out, uh, but it was really uh, that was kind of my solution um, in the heat of the moment. Um, you know, uh, well here's another question. Someone said, "How far do you think the uh, Dow or S and P? So how how far can the stock market drop before the BCOM is dragged down with it?" Wall Street tends to sell its winners to cover their losses. I agree with you. I don't think that people are invested enough in the commodity market that they um, really, you know, they're not they're not really trying to, you know, match their uh, percentage returns. They're really trying to match their dollars, right? So there's they're not invested enough in commodities to um, to really be a selling pressure on the commodity market uh, because there's not enough dollars invested for those winners to to cover the losses. Uh, so you know, I think that uh, you know we used to say that commodities are uh, underinvested and underowned and unloved. I think that people are learning to uh, love commodities. That, that, that diversification benefits from diversification benefits uh, from the commodity markets are starting to love it there. Uh, but I don't think they really have gotten invested enough into the commodity market for the for the commodity market to really be uh, dragged under by some selling pressure um, there. Uh, Another question is, what will be the capital funding opportunities for, quote, dirty industries with the focus on ESG? And this came up in the news uh, last week um, a little bit uh, where, where some, some, uh, some uh, you know, companies with a, a big E, uh, not, not Enron, a big E uh, in terms of their and on the environmental side got kicked out of some ESG indices. And really, it's because of the social and gov or on the governance side of things, whereas the uh, there are some you know uh, dirty companies quote, quote unquote dirty companies in the same ESG index because they have very good G on the government's governance side of things. So it's it's very interesting in the ES, whole ESG focus uh, that there are competing forces. Everyone tends to think on the E side is the overwhelming uh, thing, but from us from you know our perspective, uh, it, it is those three components, and so you kind of have to weigh them all together equally. And so there can be some different. Um, you know, so there can be some differences there, but I do think that uh, you know th those dirty industries, as as this uh, questioner had, I uh, think that there are you know as Sam showed, there are some good uh, capital investing opportunities. There's a lot of upside there uh, from the commodity side of things, and so that's kind of why we're that's why we're very bullish on the fundamental side of the uh, of the commodity um, of, of the commodity market. Um, so one person said, given the returns in the long short portfolio, have you considered using other investments such as ultra short bonds? Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that, you know, we still, I, I would say, no, we want to be 100% invested in commodities at all times. Um, the long short portfolio, uh, the, the returns that we showed on the previous screen uh, are the returns over the life of the, of the strategy. So there are times when we're not in it. So when we're not in it, like today, uh, we're still generating returns. We're still running the um, calculating the returns. It's just not affecting the portfolio overall. I will say that uh, when we do invest in the in this index in the in the index and in the long short side of things, um, we are buying T bills to as the underlying collateral. So we're not going crazy and uh, you you know using double lines. Obviously, well known for our fixed income uh, prowess. We're not using that fixed income 
uh, prowess here in the in the commodity structure we're buying t-bills and luckily when we launched the fund in 2015 uh, we weren't getting very much uh, return or, or yield out of the t-bills at least today and uh, you know if the fed continues on its uh, hiking cycle we'll continue to generate even more uh, yield on that t-bill side of things uh, but really not uh, looking to to take that long short portfolio out uh, really it's a you know it's a crucial piece of, of the puzzle um and, you know, I guess, let's see, what, there's some other questions. Uh, do we recommend broad-based commodity exposure or do we, would you, you know, want, rather exploit the current supply shortages in energy? I think it's very dangerous to, you know, if you think you know where the, um, where the energy market is going to go. Uh, I think, you know, we look at it from a fundamental perspective. We like the way it's going to move, but also we know that th these things take time. So uh, if, you can, if you can buy energy and you can hold it, then that make then that makes sense, but you also have to be wary of the the contango and rolling those the, the commodity futures is really a thing that can eat away at your returns over over time. That's why we want to be on the backward dated side of things uh, where possible, and really think the broad based exposure makes sense. That's where really when we look at the diversification benefits uh, to to the to the fixed income market to the uh, stock market. It's really the broad based commodities that that give you that benefit. And remember that commodities are. Yeah, you know, there's there's low correlation underneath the commodity markets themselves. So your uh, energy is not necessarily correlated to your metals. It's not necessarily correlated to your agriculture and livestock. So you get some more diver diversification benefits, um, diversification benefits versus your uh, you know diversification of your diversification. I guess is is the best way to say it. Um, you know, uh, one of the other questions is commodities have experienced double digit gains year to date. Uh, how much more room do commodities have to run? Uh, and I think, you know, Sam covered it a lot in that, uh, you know, a lot of the fundamental side, you know, we, we, we have, uh, commodities have been up a lot. Uh, they are the kind of only alternative that's been positive year to date. Uh, but I think there is still some room to run. You can see that from the commodity super cycle side of things, there is um, room to go uh, to get to the prior peak, which is always kind of the, if you look at that as the prior peak, is that how much of the, um, and that's how much upside you have, I guess, if you're looking at it from a chart perspective. Uh, so there is some room to run there. And that's really why we wanted to focus on the fundamentals at the beginning, because this is a question that we get a lot. You know, commodities are up a lot. Did I miss the boat? And we don't think you missed the boat. We think there's still time to get in over the long term. Uh, but while these fundamentals, uh, the fundamental story works itself out. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk about is commodities inflation. You know, when we do look at inflation, it is uh, very high. And But even though if we do look at it, um, you know, we, we run some internal numbers. We think that inflation, headline inflation, not core inflation, will still be uh, above, you know, call it 6% or so, um, if not higher over the average, over the rest of the, or over the over 2022 calendar year. Uh, so that's going to be elevated levels and that commodity markets will still be able to benefit from that uh, kind of inflation perspective uh, from, from um, you know, that inflation driven um, markets. Um, Let's see, what else do we have here? I got, I'll have time for one more question. Um, ah, here's the, and here's the question that we get a lot. If commodities are going to run big, why not own the equities of companies that extract them? And I, this, is, this, is a, this is a great question. We get it a lot. The problem with owning the equities of companies that extract commodities is that they're equities. And you have the equity beta. So when equities are going down, like they are, they have been so far this year, uh, the commodity companies are going down with them. Uh, you've you've seen, I guess, if you look at the energy energy um, you know sector, that's the only, that's the one that's the big performing sector so far year to date. So that's kind of the um, you know the exception that that kind of proves the rule. But I think overall, when you look at the commodity companies, they are going to be generally exposed to that uh, exposed to the to the equity beta, and that really uh, when you you would expect that beta to overwhelm the over underlying fundamentals over the short term. Um, so for, for us, when we always say, if we like the commodity, uh, if we like oil, we like you know, industrial metals, buy the, buy, you know, we like it, don't go a second derivative into the equity side of things, buy the commodity, buy the thing that you, that you like, as opposed to something that you like that you hope is going to benefit from the thing that you like. And I guess with that, I'll, I'll close it out. We were hit just on the hour. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for, for tuning in. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference. We appreciate your participation. You may now disconnect.